welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. Well, we are in Acts chapter 12 today. Please pull out your Bibles. We're going to get straight into it. Acts chapter 12. Oh, if we haven't met yet, my name's Josh. I get to serve on the pastoral team, and I'm in the seniors ministry. <laughs> uh, Acts chapter 12 is where we camp today, and um, it's been a great journey so far. We are uh, week 12 into 28 weeks, and uh, it's a great journey. I trust that you are asking the Holy Spirit to help you, and also to see Jesus as you work through this book, as we do it together. Make sure you pay attention to the daily devotions, not just in your journals that we have. We've still got some journals left out in the foyer on the um, info station. But we also have online video devotions on our Facebook, on our YouTube. Make sure you avail yourself to that. I think it's 6 or 6.30 every morning, is that right? Or thereabouts. We're going to get into it just now. And we're going to, Reverend Gary, I'm going to ask you to read it in three sections, okay? So you're going to be up and down like a yo-yo today. You're going to be okay with that? It's going to work those legs out. I know you like that. Look at those oaks of righteousness. Now, so just so that you understand some context, um, what you're going to see in this chapter is as the church is expanding, Herod Agrippa uh, comes and he looks to really go after some of God's people. You see Herod, you're going to see him kill one of the 12 disciples, one of them named John, uh, James, excuse me, you're going to see him arrest Peter, and then you're going to see him lose Peter in the story. Peter goes walkabout. But then you're going to see Herod die. Okay, so there's a, there's a great tension. It's quite a fascinating uh, passage that we're going to get into together. And you're going to see a comparison of God exaltation and self-exaltation. What happens as a result of that? Okay. And in particular, if you oppose God, you lose. That's, that's what the book's about. If you oppose God, you lose. God wins. Spoiler alert. Okay, thanks. If you can read from verse 1 to verse 5 first. Thanks, Gary. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Wonderful. So... Herod Agrippa I is, is on the run looking for some Christians. He finds James and he executes him by the sword. More than likely, he beheads the man. And what happens is really interesting. It says that when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he decided to arrest Peter also. So he, he's really after Peter. Um, popularity of the people he wants people to like him often people that are in leadership in charge they they do like to be liked and that's what we're seeing happen here where Herod notices that he's winning the crowd over so he continues to further the cause of coming against God's people what you're going to see here is that whenever there is opposition to God's people um it doesn't stop the flourishing of God's people. It never does. We're going to see that theme again and again and again and again throughout the scriptures. Again, whenever you oppose God, you will lose. But what's interesting here is that God, we're going to read this, God allows James to die, but another man named Peter to live. Here it's important for us to understand that God is in control. 
he's he's totally in control. He sits providentially above everything. Sometimes we're going to see that hard things, bad things, difficult things happen to people that do good. Have you ever felt like that before? You're going through, living your life, minding your old BNS, doing the right thing, and things happen. You're like, what gives? What happened? James is doing the right thing. He's serving God, trusting God, but God allows this to take place. That should never rock our bo- uh, our boats. Never. We should always be able to stay cool, calm, and collected. God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked. In the last 48 hours, perhaps you've turned your TVs on and you've enjoyed the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics. Was that fun or what? I didn't watch it. But I had a lot of messages come through. I saw the news articles and... And my goodness me, what a mockery that seems to be against the church in particular. If you're unaware with the opening ceremony in Paris, there are a number of things taking place. One thing you might have seen, there was a golden calf that appeared to be created and worshipped. Did you see that? But here a very stark, uh, confronting image appeared of uh, the Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci's. You know Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper? Can we show a picture of what that looks like for those that don't know? The Last Supper. That's the famous picture. The Last Supper. Well, the, um, the organizers of the Olympics in Paris spending, was it $1.6 billion on this opening ceremony? Decided to, as part of its main scenes, uh, recreate that picture. And we see drag queens. We see a young child in the yellow there. Can you see that? In the middle there, a lady depicting Christ or another version of Christ. And the idea here for the man that has put this together, the idea behind it is that he wants to show people, show the world, in fact, that everybody is included. How noble is that? Everyone's included. But for those of us that trust in Christ, we know that that really is quite insulting to Christ, to what he stands for, and what Christianity is all about. We live in a world, particularly in the West, we seem to be losing ourselves. But can I just say, God is still in control. I'm, I haven't lost any sleep over this. I'm very frustrated even insulted, but that's because people are insulting Jesus. It's not about me, it's people, what they're doing and saying about Jesus Christ. There is a flaunting of sinfulness. It's arrogant about Christ Jesus and what he stands for. So truth be told, me personally, I'm not watching the Olympics. I'm just not going to do it. I love sports. I'm just not going to, I'm not going to watch it. I was saying that to my kids. We were talking about it just yesterday and they said, Dad, I don't think they're going to care. I said, I don't care if they care or not. I care that I care. That's It's about me. I personally, I'm just not going to get into it. God's in control. He's not surprised by this. We are living in an era that is apocalyptic, which is where things become uncovered, things that are hidden are now seen, this is a necessary thing to take place. There have been undercurrents of this for some time, but now we're seeing things come to the surface. This is an opportunity for the light to shine clearly. The darker that it becomes, the more clearly light is seen. This is an opportunity for God's church. This is a window that we have. And we're going to see perhaps wheat separated from chaff. We're going to see sifting. That's all okay. It may very well and probably will get a little bit worse for us. But that's okay. And we're going to see in Acts chapter 12 where there is a mockery. There is a um, a tribulation that the church is going through. But it doesn't stop the church from exploding. It doesn't 
stop the church from expanding. It acts as fertilizer for fruit to be produced. We are living in exciting time. We know and we want that Jesus is coming back, but let's think about that for a second. If we really want Jesus to come back and we really believe that he's coming back, what are the conditions we think would exist for Christ to come back in? We're living in very, very, very exciting times and we, foot, we should feel absolutely privileged and honored that God decided, he designed to place us on this earth at this time for this very reason. He's called you. It's not an accident that you're here and it's not an accident that you're here alive today. What is he saying to you? We have people like Elon Musk, who this morning on Twitter or X, he said, unless there is bravery to stand up from what is fair and right, Christianity will perish. Elon Musk, the world's richest man. Is he a Christian? He's not a Christian. He'll say that he's not a Christian, but he adheres to Christian values. When a man like Elon Musk is saying that, I think we should pay attention. Do I think he's entirely correct? No, I don't actually. I think he's half right. Because Christianity will never perish. Are we called to stand? Yes, we're called to stand. Absolutely. We must stand for righteousness. We must stand for truth. We must stand for what is right. But Christianity will never perish. That has always been the pattern of God's church throughout the ages. There is nothing new taking place now. But it's an opportunity for the salt to be salty. There's a reason why Christianity has been constantly targeted constantly can you imagine if there was a depiction of anti-jewish or anti-islamic rhetoric what would have taken oh my giddy aunt it would have been a very different ball game but there is something about god's people that is meek and that is mild and there is a humility that must come from us but we shouldn't mistake that from a from a strength perhaps a gentle strength that is bold in him what is God saying to you? How is he calling you to live in this day and in this hour? Watch what takes place here. Verse 4, When he had seized Peter, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers. Stop for a second. How much is in a squad? Four. There are four squads. There are 16 people. There are 16 soldiers guarding Peter. Because there were rumors about these disciples escaping. There were rumors about God being on. Now, hang on, this, we, cannot, we cannot take any chances. 16 people. Intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people, likely for further execution. And it says something really interesting, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but, here's a big but, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. That's what they did. They prayed. I'm not anti-protest. I've been to protest before, but that's not what they did. They didn't protest. They didn't pick it. They didn't write letters. I'm, I'm not opposed to this. I write letters. I write emails to my local members of parliament, my federal member. I do that, but that's not what they did. The Bible tells us that what they did was they earnestly prayed for Peter. That's what the church did. See, earnest intercession opens the door for divine intervention. Earnest intercession. Not haphazard intercession. Not weak, watered down intercession. Earnest, fervent intercession. That's what they did. An earnest intercession opens the door for divine intervention. We're going to see what takes place after they prayed. This is what they did. They prayed. So God was in control. He was ruling. He was reigning. But they still prayed. This is what Matthew Henry says in his commentary. God's providence leaves room for the use of of our prudence which means God's always in control 
but he, he leaves room for us to act with wisdom, to do something in the present. That stops me from folding my hands and saying, well, God's in control. He'll do whatever he wants, whatever he wants, however he wants, whichever way he wants. No, there's an invitation while God is in control for me to get involved and engage and to intercede for that intervention. Wishing won't get the job done. Wishing will never be a substitute for prayer. There is something so incredibly important when it comes to prayer. This is what Martin Luther says. Prayer is a strong wall and fortress of the church. It's a godly Christian weapon. John Piper says this. Prayer is the open admission. Oh, I love this one. Prayer is the open admission that without Christ, we can do nothing. And prayer is the turning away from ourselves to God in the confidence that he will provide the help we need. Prayer humbles us as needy and exalts God as wealthy. I don't know about you, but I have found in my life that the more that I pray, the more coincidence tend to happen. Have you ever found that? They just, all of a sudden, these coincidences just start to pop up the more that I pray. They just happen more and more. Can I show the picture, please, of Sanjay? You would have heard Pastor Brett before uh, talk about Pastor Sanjay and his wife. See in the, in, the, in the purple top there? That's Sanjay and that's his wife. Here's a note that we just received from them. Remember, we have been praying for the release of this couple recently. We rejoice and give thanks to the Lord for the release of Pastor Sanjay Matthew from the district jail. After 34 days of incarceration since June 20, 2024, due to his unwavering faith in Christ, Pastor Matthew is finally free. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to ADF allied lawyers, whose tireless efforts and unwavering dedication have made this possible. We also thank, and this is where I think the miracle took place. We also thank all our prayer partners for their constant prayers and support for Pastor Matthew and his family during this time of persecution. God's faithfulness has been evident through this trial and we celebrate his goodness. We prayed, God heard, and he opened the doors. Never underestimate the power of your prayer. Don't think that a cry to God from the heart, even if it's just a sigh of dependence, it's to God. It totally makes a difference. When we pray, things happen. I'm going to ask Gary, would you please read now the next big chunk? Let's go from verse 6 through to verse 19, okay? This is following the fact that the church began to pray. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but though he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them on its own accord and they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. 
When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. Then said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened, they saw him and were amazed. But monitoring to them, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and sent time there and spent time there. Wonderful, thank you. So it says there in verse six, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. The night before, he was going to be put out to people and likely executed. What's he doing? He's sleeping. Man, I find that fascinating. How far to be sleep? But he was between two soldiers bound with two chains. Centuries before the door were guarding the prison. And it says this, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him. A light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. And he said, get up quickly. And at that moment, his chains fell off. The angel then said, dress yourself, put on your sandals. He did so. He said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. He went out and he followed him. He didn't know what he was being done by the angel. He didn't know if it was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into a city. I mean, this is a big deal. And it opened for them of its own accord. They went out and went along one street and meet the angel then left him. Then Peter came to himself and he said, wow, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel rescue me from the hand of Herod, from all the Jewish people that we're expecting. So he's asleep. At first, he kind of is not sure if it's real or not. But an angel appears, touches him, releases him from his chains. At that point right there, he's loose, he's liberated, and he's free. The angel had spoken to him, but it was only when he did what the angel spoke for him to do that he managed to fully experience that freedom. See, freedom fully comes when we have the faith to fully walk in it. He put on his sandals, as he was told. He dressed himself, as he was told. He wrapped the cloak around him, as he was told. And he followed the angel, as he was told. He was unbound, he was unchained, he was free, but it was only when he obeyed. It was only when he fully walked out that faith that he experienced full freedom. I wonder at times, if we as God's people, we are not fully experiencing the freedom that we have because we're not stepping out in faith the way that we should. See, we have been fully forgiven of all of our sins. And in one sense, we know that. But in another sense, maybe we're holding those same sins against us and we're living bound up. I'm not sure of your experience in your walk with Christ, but I have the assurance that those in whom the sun sets free is free indeed, yet sometimes we are caught 
bound up. We're not bound up because God has done it. We're bound up because we're believing it. We, we, we haven't got out of that mentality. When I was in Zambia recently with the team, Barney Lim, who on the team was actually got quite ill for about a day and his leg was really sore and he was feeling quite sore and I'm going into, you know, pastoral brother mode. I'm like, hey, what can I, can I help you? What, how is Bunny? Is he okay? Can I get you some more vitamins? And, and, and Bunny at the time, very, you know, very gingerly walking around with a really, really sore knee. But Bunny has this air of faith to him that I find a little bit uh, uh, confronting. He'll say things like, the facts are I'm in pain, but the truth is I'm healed. And he'll say things like, I know that um, I, I can't really walk, but I'm healed in Jesus' name and I'm going to keep on going. And my engineering brain says, hang on a second, you can't deny the reality. You need to take care of yourself. And that's real. We've got to be wise. But every time I, I seem to see Bunny walk this thing out, live this thing out, and just get on with his life. He's like a hundred and, what are you now, buddy? How old are you now? <laughs> right, he's, he's still a young buck. I don't know how he does it. But it's provocative. It's challenging, but it's inspiring. And so for us, I wonder at times, our father says, hey, look, I've set you free. I've forgiven you. I've healed you. I've blessed you. I'm taking care of you. Stop living inside your boxed up mentality. Come on, get going. I've already spoken to you. I've, un I've unchained you. Get going. Put on your clothes. Get out the door. I'll open the door for you. Just get going. But while we are sitting and we are squabbling or we are... Feeling sorry for ourselves. We've got our security blankets comforting us. We're being hindered from getting out there and seeing the miracle unfold. It's only when we get out of the boat that we can then walk on water. He's saying, come. But will we come? He's spoken to you. What has he said to you? What are his promises? Know it. Believe it. And act on it. I've got some money. Who likes the 20 and who likes the 50? You like both. Who wants a $70? I've got $70 for you. I've got $70 for you. So yours. What was the difference between the number of people that put up their hands and Karis? She just got up and she took it. Our loving father says, I have something for you. Do you want it? And we can sit down on a little tushies and say, it's me, I want it, I want it. But it's only when we get off our tushies and go and get it. That takes faith. What things has God got for you? What are the promises that he said? Here you go. He wants us to act on it. Faith, true faith, will show itself with action. Freedom fully comes when we have the faith to fully walk in it. We see further down, interesting, Peter goes out, he goes to someone's house. He knocks on the door. A servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. <laughs> Verse 14, she recognizes Peter's voice in her joy. She didn't open the gate. She's just so excited. She runs off. They think 
they think, oh, it's it's it, once they come back, they're like, hang on a second, no, that's got to be that's got to be the angel of 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 Peter because there was a belief there in that time that people had a guardian angel and that the angel could well uh, mimic and reflect the person that they were taking care of. That's what they were thinking. So um, eventually, Peter gets let in. He goes, Shh, don't 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 let the don't let the cat out of the bag. Okay, I don't want to be killed. Yeah, fair fair enough, right? But is it when when the day came? When day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. So it became a big thing. And after Herod searched for him and didn't find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. That's a lot of death. That's a lot of people dying, right? Because they lost this guy. Was there a conspiracy? What was going on? But then it goes on. I'm going to get you to read the last five verses, please. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God, and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Wow, that is so interesting. So Herod's not too happy here, right? (laughs) understandably, because his prized possession was taken from right under his nose. He's gone missing. He's already upset. And um, he, he, he's getting a, a petition um, made of him for some food. So uh, Tyre and Sidon is near modern-day Lebanon. Galilee is like the breadbasket of the region. And so people are in desperate need of food. Now, what's interesting here is that uh, Herod Agrippa, it says in verse 21, puts on his royal robes. He's looking pretty good right about now. He's sitting on his royal throne. He's delivering a beautiful speech to them. And the people were shouting, this is the voice of God and not a man. At this point... It's not Herod's problem because that's what people are saying. What becomes Herod's problem is he receives it, he accepts it, he believes it. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. Immediately. And it says, he. I love that God includes in this the fact that he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. I mean, God was not too happy with this guy. He decided to put that in. Not just that that's how he, he dropped dead and then he died with the worms eating him, whether it was intestinal, there's a lots of conversation around that. Keep in mind that Luke, the physician, writes this. So a doctor is writing this. He gets eaten by worms. Josephus talks about this as well in some of his writings, that this actually did take place. So... God decides to leave that in the scriptures for us to know. It's a picture of what he thinks of people when they take the credit away from God. God not doesn't just want, he deserves all the glory. He doesn't just want, he deserves all of the honor. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. With our faith offering next Sunday, you heard me say, he gets the glory. No one else gets the glory. This is an issue for glory. God, you get the glory with this. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know what the next six or 12 months is going to look like. I'm sure there are going to be repercussions as you move me in the realm of faith and generosity. But you get the glory with how this unfolds. You get the credit. You get the honor. Herod, in this moment, decides to not humble himself and deflect the glory. It is far better to humble yourself than have God do it for you. 
It's far better to humble yourself than have God do it for you. And Herod found out the hard way. He thought he was all that in a bag of potato chips. He, he kills James. He incarcerates Peter in readiness for an execution. He loses the guy. He's not happy. He, he, he oh, what am I going to do? Hang on a second. Yes, I'll feed these people. I am really, really good. You're like God. Yes, I am. Gone. An angel of the Lord actually frees Peter, but we read an angel of the Lord kills Herod. This passage is all about the glory of God. And self-seeking glory is a stumbling block for faith in Christ. It really is. In John 5 verse 44, Jesus says, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you don't seek the glory that comes from the only God? See, if, 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 if all I'm trying to do is, is get the credit, get the glory for myself, I'll be blinded by my own arrogance. And I won't be able to put my faith in the God who deserves it. I won't go there because of time. But in Daniel, we see chapter 2, and then you can read in chapter 4. Daniel writes that God changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and he sets up kings. In chapter 4 and verse 30 and 32, you'll eat grass like an ox, Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, until you've learned that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he wills. See, God has the last laugh. He has the last laugh. Every day of the week, no matter what you're going through, God wins. In Psalm 2 verse 4, He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Psalm 37 verse 13, But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. God gets the last laugh. He wins and have a guess what i'm on his side i'm so glad i'm on his side oh father kill pride in me help me to get rid of it where i seek after affirmation acclamation approval of people oh lord help me you deserve it all we heard Josie earlier put us toward, it was James chapter 4. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. First Peter 5 verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Luke 14 11, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, I'm not, I'm not proud, I'm not arrogant. I'm not like King Herod. Pride always says things like this, if you want to just have a bit of a heart check. Pride says things like this. I know better. I'm right. It sounds like this. I'm self-made. I'm worthy of honor. I deserve better. I don't need anyone, including God. Pride is more concerned with who is right. Humility is more concerned with what is right. And so I wonder if there is a little bit of Herod in each of us. And Lord, if there is, he's got to die. He's got to get off that throne. In the last couple of weeks, you would have seen in the news, uh, world news actually, that there was an assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump. Did you see the news on that? Now, this man has not been known for his humility in the past. But as he was giving his speech, his final speech, aired live on TV by CNN. First time they've 
done a live stream. Anyway, he was giving his speech and as he turned to the right, some bullets passed his head. The first bullet, as he turned, just at the right moment, clipped the back of his ear. He eventually dropped to the floor. He should have died. But he didn't. However you look at it, God spared his life. I don't care what your politics is. God spared him. Now, this is not what he said. He did not say following that. I ducked that bullet. I turned at just the right moment. The bullet was huge. Came all the way from, from China. He didn't say that. There was a very different person after that moment. Here are some of the things that he said just days after. There was blood pouring everywhere and yet in a certain way I felt very safe because I had God on my side. He then said, I am not supposed to be here tonight. This is at the convention that they had. I'm not supposed to be here tonight. Thousands of people then started cheering. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. He could have been like Herod in that moment. But he says, I'm not supposed to be here. And I'll tell you, I stand before you in this arena only by the grace of Almighty God. He later said, thank you to everyone for your thoughts and prayers as it was God alone who prevented the unthinkable from happening. It's only God who gives life. It's God who blesses. It's God who enriches. He gets all the glory. He deserves all the glory. Any crowns that we think we have, any, any badges we've accumulated, any merits that we might have, certificates that we've won, degrees that we finished. He gets all the glory. He gets all the honor. And we are called to live in a healthy, reverential fear of the holy God. And if we do live in a fear of God, we'll never have to fear anything else ever. I want to finish with this song. We sang it just earlier. It's about laying our crowns at the feet of Jesus. And this is the call today for us, church. It's for us to, in this moment, give him the crowns that belong to him. Every good and perfect thing, every gift that comes from above. Every day is a blessing. Every breath is a gift. How can we not thank him? How can we not give him the honor? He's worthy. He's worthy. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.